Thanks for listening to In Studio from Simply Timeless. My name is Jade Daniels. Our guest this week is vocalist and composer Sarah Gazerik. Originally from Seattle, she now calls Los Angeles home. Like many, her own musical journey has had its share of ups and downs. Yet last year in 2019, her release Thirsty Ghost was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Jazz Vocal Album. During our interview, Sarah shares some of the experiences that led to this gratifying moment in her career. Here to share her story is Sarah Gazarek. You know, I think I would say that I come from a musical family, but not in the conventional use of the word. I think everyone in my family has really strong musical instincts, really a strong sense of rhythm, intonation, good voices, but I don't have anyone in my family, at least immediate family, that is a professional musician or really anybody that pushed my siblings or I to take private instruction or be enrolled in music classes, musical instincts, but but not necessarily professional musicians in the family. How many siblings did you have? I've got two. I have one older brother and an even older sister. So you're the youngest out of the three. Yes, I'm the typical creative youngest sibling. Was there much age difference between you and your siblings? There's just two years between each of us. So my sister's four years older and my brother is two years older. So they didn't torture you too badly then? Uh, I would disagree, but we're all friends now, and that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up an only child, so everything was mine, and all the space was mine. I didn't have to share. Still have troubles with that every now and then. You you mentioned that there wasn't really, your parents were not those who say, okay, you're going to do this, this, and this in music. There are some parents who are musical themselves and want to impart that to their children. So let's, I, I, I want to dig at this for a bit. Um what were some of the early musical sounds that you were hearing then? I would assume that you heard music at home in some form or another. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it wasn't constantly on in the background. I remember my mom, in terms of jazz, had Cleo Lane. She loved Cleo Lane and would play Cleo Lane's CDs. She had two CDs that she played of hers. Um, but then, you know, it was like a lot of musicals. My mom loved Camelot, and so she would have the Camelot musical soundtrack on the background and my stepdad really loved um celtic music and so there was a lot of like celtic folk music that i listened to as a child um but then as a young adult i you know just listened to what young people listen to a lot of stuff from the radio madonna mariah carey michael jackson stevie wonder um it really was like very much a pedestrian experience it was not concentrated in any regard but the, the influence of those musicals carried you through school. In fact, uh, musical theater and dance were two major influences and things that you were passionate about from an early age. Yeah, I think my mom did a really good job of allowing all of the siblings to, um, and encouraging us to pursue that which inspired us. And so, you know, a lot of different things like space camp, horse camp, um, soccer, theater, and then if something sparked an interest, we would continue down the road. So I played saxophone for a year and a half, lost interest, um, moved into theater and acting, and that was something that I really, really loved. Um, and that was why I went to the high school that I went to. They have a phenomenal theater program and was just fortunate as a young person who wanted to just participate in as many artistic endeavors as possible, was fortunate to have landed in a jazz choir that was also directed by the award-winning um, jazz band director. So instead of singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow and Cummerbunds, we were transcribing Miles Davis solos and talking about, um, you know, the great big bands of, of our time. And you were lucky because I know of so many schools that are fighting just to have a basic music program. And yet your school there in Seattle, uh, you had a great emphasis on jazz. You had choral opportunities. Um, thinking about jazz choir, I know that as children, and many of us, you know, we love to, we love to sing around the house. We like to sing in the car with mom and dad. Um, were you one of those who took to singing early? Absolutely. Yeah, I always loved singing. And there are even stories of me coming down the stairs in the middle of my mom's dinner parties and, you know, arms open singing somewhere over the rainbow, or tomorrow on key at the age of three without modulating or, you know, losing my center or whatever. 
Um, and, you know, because my whole family sings and sings well, I just thought that it was something that everyone liked and everyone did really well. And it wasn't until high school that I realized that there were some people that were terrified of it, some people that didn't like it doing it themselves. And then some people um, that as hard as they tried just didn't have an instinct for it. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that you hit it on the head that, you know, Seattle has a really artistic um reputation that there's a lot of like strong musicians that come out of Seattle and a big part of that has a lot to do with the public school systems and the fact that they are willing to fund some of these programs and kind of allow educators to afford young people the opportunities that would continue to shape a life beyond that day. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that specific program. I would think that there were lessons that you learned singing in choir that carried through to your work as a leader with the ensemble um, because there's a big difference between singing solo and then singing with a group of people. What were some of the things that you were able to take away from your time in jazz choir? You know, I think honestly, it probably shaped my sense of rhythm a lot um, because there, our director at the time, his name is Scott Brown, um, has such a strong sense of swing. And I think that it's really tough to teach that. And so he, um, he did a really great job just kind of showing us and by way of listening and demonstrations. And um, I think I graduated from that program with a really strong sense of rhythm. Um, and just in terms of jazz choir and the way that harmony is structured, it's pretty intense. And so I think it probably developed my ears beyond, you know, where they would have naturally developed. Absolutely. Um, and then more than anything, that was just where I fell in love with jazz. And so I think that that carried over um, Scott Brown's love of jazz and what he showed us and the doors that he opened for us in that three years that I spent with him, um, I'll take with me forever. Your studies carried you from Seattle to Southern California to USC, and um, you, you chose to um, do your higher education studies there. What was your focus at USC? I was a jazz studies major. Um, and my instrument was voice. And so um, I actually got a Bachelor of Science in Jazz Studies, which is a performance degree, but also has a little bit of music industry. And so I took like contract law and um, actually did a radio class where I had to like transcribe radio, radio broadcasts and talk about how many advertisements and the quality of voices and all. It was, it was interesting. <laughs> did you ever do any uh, radio programs of your own? You know, I've been a guest artist, a guest DJ on a couple of different radio stations and kind of like programming the hour, two hours. Um, but I've never been a like a contracted host. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you are still involved with USC. You're on the faculty there. Yeah, I'm an adjunct instructor in the jazz studies program, but teach pretty much full time. I have two classes that I teach there and anywhere, depending on the semester, anywhere from six to 15 students. How long was it after you graduated that you released your first album? Fill in that gap for me. Yeah. So um, when I was in college, uh, you know, anyone who either knows a college student or, uh, you know, is related to one or is trying to fund their collegiate education, we all know that at least in this country, college is associated with pretty crippling debt. And I knew that I was graduating into a career that wasn't also wasn't associated with high earnings uh, and income. And so I wanted to have as much aid and scholarships and award money as I possibly could. And, and in an attempt to raise my profile as a student, I applied for the Downey Student Music Awards and ended up winning in 2003 for Best Collegiate Jazz Vocalist. And um, there just happened that month to be a management company that was looking for a young singer to join um, a big jazz festival tour with Karen Allison and Diane Shore and Alita Adams. And they asked me to join. And so I signed on for the tour and also with that management company and also with William Morris, who was the booking agent of the tour. Um, and at that time was a really big power player in the jazz world for agencies. Um, and so shortly thereafter recorded my first album, which came out I think in 2005, which was a year after I graduated college. So in that period of two years, went from student in music theory class to performing in most every jazz club in the country um, over the span of two years. 
And you provide a perfect segue for my next point. So the, the album is called Yours, and it was released in 2005. Your first of six albums that you've released to date. As with your most recent, the name of that album is Thirsty Ghost. Uh, yours featured a number of familiar standards sprinkled with more contemporary works. You serve as vocalist, accompanied by the ensemble. Um, but even with those similarities, when you compare the two albums, there are certainly differences between them, even though maybe it's a similar song selection, but I think your reasoning for picking the songs has changed. And I also think that your approach to producing the album, not only the technical sound and the formatting, but also, you know, putting yourself into it. I think those things certainly uh, have changed, have evolved. So if you would, thinking about these two albums, the first and the sixth, you know, the first and the most recent, how would you describe your musical journey and evolution between those two releases? Yeah, so as you pointed out, I was probably about 21 years old when I recorded yours and had just come out of college and for better or for worse, had a few mentors at the time who um, personally had pretty strong stigmas um, towards young people in jazz. Um, I think that that, w that used to be um, a little bit more intense than it is today. And so I think I had a little bit of fear surrounding being like a young jazz artists that kind of exploded on the scene. And I didn't know, I wasn't established as an artist quite yet. I just knew that I was scared of, of being projected as this like jazz ingenue um, out of fear that that might um, illegitimize my artistry and also might create a path for me where I might become obsolete in a year or two there was a sense of uh, like a lack of clarity in terms of who I was. Um, but the beauty of that record is that it is a snapshot of who I was at that time. So a lot of the songs on that record are represented by specific experiences. Like we do a cover of You're My Sunshine. I chose that song because my mom used to sing it to me every night before I went to bed. Um, Circle Game, the Joni Mitchell composition, I chose because it was a song that a camp counselor used to sing to us as children. There was, there's a reason why every song is on that record, and that's something that I'm incredibly proud of. I think that when I look back on yours, I feel very, like I said, I feel proud uh, of the courage that I think it took to really put that album out there with a clear stamp of like, this is who I am in this moment, like who I am, not a projection of who I think someone wants me to be, but who I am. Having been in the music world, uh, right when things kind of shifted and collapsed at, at the onset of iTunes being a, a pretty prolific music distributor and kind of uh, the, the music industry scrambling to figure out where it exists in that spectrum, um, that hasn't stopped. You know, the music industry has shifted and changed and everybody's had to reinvent the wheel with every release. And I've definitely experienced that. Um, but the one thing that I think was the same from my first record to the fifth record was this awareness of what my audience wanted me to be. That I had had a mentor, a different mentor express to me that your audience wants you to, like they want respite. You know, they want to come to a show, they've paid to see you perform, they brought, uh, you know, a sitter to be with the kids and drove all the way down and paid for parking. And so make sure that you not only put on a consistently good show, but also, make them feel happy because that's what they want. And I think that the major difference between the first five records and this, and this last record is that for the last record, I actually asked myself as an artist, what I value as a person and what I value in art that I experience and what I want to gain from seeing art and or watching music um, and tried to employ that in my experience as the creator, which was a really terrifying journey to be on as someone who, like for me, I think the, the duty of an artist is to, as authentically as possible, create a space where the audience can see themselves reflected in the message of what the artist is expressing, um, instead of being impressed or being manipulated to feel something. I think that's like, not my job. That's not my genre. 
it's not something that I identify with anymore. Um, but I want to look at my life and say, okay, I have experienced these things. I can only assume that other people have experienced them. If I can create a space where I'm genuinely, genuinely expressing this concept, this experience, this feeling, maybe if I do it right, people can see themselves reflected in it and can process and come out the other side as well. What do you see when you look at your audience? I think if I've done my job right, I see humanity, you know, that like I, if I'm actually present in the expression of these concepts, that what I am feeling, they are also feeling and we're feeling it together. And there's sort of this swirling energetic ball of whatever it is in that moment. And it shifts because in, in humanity that shifts, you know, at some point the song isn't always about loss. At some point the heart, the song is about lightness and transcendence. At some point the song is about hope. Um, so I think I see myself, but also everyone, you know, I think I see the, the grand experience of humanity. Um, hopefully every once in a while you see someone on a cell phone, <laughs> a bright Imagine blue light that. on a face. I know. Um, but for the most part, I think I see like a unification, which is pretty beautiful when it happens. Your journey, just like many others, has uh, had its fair share of ups and downs. You might call them bumps in the road. Uh, and I, I was gathering the information from your website, and I was rather astounded to just read all of that you went through in a relatively short period of time. You know, there was the dis the dissolvement of a marriage. There was a romance that didn't go well. And then even your mother, she had her entire life flash right before her in a car accident. And one of those to go through for most people would have been, you know, trying enough. And yet you went through each of those and then some. If we can dig at those one by one, how did each of those episodes affect you on a personal level? Um, I think, you know, in the big picture, they're all absolutely related. You know, I think that in the, in the big scheme of things, there was a realization that I was still making music that wasn't reflective of the lessons that I had learned or the experience that I was going through. And that I was projecting as an educator, this value system that I, of things that I truly valued of authenticity and expression and making sure that the songs that you're communicating, you really identify with, otherwise, what are we doing? Um, and so recognizing that, like, as you said, there were, there were a lot of bumps in the road, there was quite a bit of tumult in my life at that time. But I was singing songs about hope and happiness and, and love, when I was not experiencing that. Um, and so in the big, big scheme of things, it was more like a, the ability to recognize this sort of dichotomy in the experience, that there was this massive rift between what I was experiencing on stage and projecting as a person versus what I was experiencing off stage. In terms of specifics, you know, I mean, I think that anytime someone is met with the gift of being able to go to the brink with a loved one and not having to actually experience the loss of that person is an eye-opening experience that my mom almost died and didn't actually die. And so I was afforded the opportunity to ask myself if I wanted to say something to her, what would I have wanted to say? If I wanted to behave in a certain way, to let down certain walls, to let go of certain hurts, what would I have wanted to do and to be given the opportunity to say, okay, this is the life I wanted to live, so go live it. Um, that was probably the biggest catalyst for everything in recognizing that, oh, oh okay, my, the marriage that I'm in is not actually the marriage that I wanted to be in. This isn't healthy, this isn't me, this isn't him. Um, it's time to dissolve it because life is short and something else awaits, even if that something else is solitude for the rest of my life. And then what I learned in the relationship that didn't go well, which actually was like a year and a half long relationship that unbeknownst to me, because it came shortly on the heels after my, my dissolution of marriage, um, was wrought with a lot of infidelity and, and lack of truth. Um, 
was just the desire to come out the other side and recognizing that as an artist, I have all of these different things available to me, so why not turn towards them? And so I didn't seek making an album. I sought learning from and, and feeling something different. And so when I chose to perform Jolene, it wasn't because I wanted to put it on an album. It was because I had experienced a Jolene. Same thing with I Believe When I Fall in Love. Every song on that record speaks to a very specific experience in that five-year timeline. But there was something inside of you that kept you going that was deeper than just the music. I mean, to have all of that happen and to say, okay, we, are, we, we can't get any further <laughs> into the bottom right now. And yet somehow you, you found your way back out of it. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm an eternal, not optimist, but like realist that I recognize that like, it's not the bottom. Things could get a lot worse. It's just not what I want. I don't want to continue to repeat the same mistakes. I want to take a look at my life and learn from it. Um, I want to be the artist that I'm telling my students to be. And so let's try something different in an attempt to yield a different result. You mentioned something about your mom, and I don't know if you want to share this or not. You said, that it offered you the opportunity to think and say, is there something I need or I want to say to my mom that I haven't? I mean, did you have the opportunity to have that conversation with her? Absolutely. And push myself to have that conversation daily, you know, with everyone that I'm intimately acquainted with. I think that, you know, for whatever reason, people have a tendency to hold back who they are and and how they're feeling. Um, for a multitude of reasons. And so I push myself to be as present and honest with her about the things that I'm grateful for and the feelings that I have, um, but also recognize that there's something there to mourn. She's a very different person than she was before her accident. And so it's not, I continue to try to chase truth instead of idealism. And so I wouldn't say that like every day I'm the best daughter in the world or every day she you know, hears from me and I tell her the litany of a hundred thousand reasons why she's the best mom in the world. I try to push myself to be honest if I'm feeling frustrated or sad or um, whatever it is that we feel as humans. You're one of the lucky ones, you know. I do know. I want to look at the title of the album and as it relates to your story and the songs, Thirsty Ghost. What, uh, what is the meaning? Yeah, Thirsty Ghost is a lyric um, in the song Distant Storm, which is originally titled When It Rains, written by Brad Meldow. And he so graciously approved the lyric in the recording, um, and we were able to include it. Um, but the, the song, in my experience, opens in this kind of vapid, dry landscape where nothing can grow because everything is so sunny, which is obviously a parallel for the space in my life where I wanted to only admit what was bright and happy in my life. Um, and a thirsty ghost, there's a, a, month, a bunch of different, you know, an, a, analogies and, and visual um, symbolism that, that can be found in that opening verse, but it ends with thirsty ghost in a blistered dawn. And a thirsty ghost um, is a, hologram shell of a person who is desperate to be satiated by things um, that could not possibly satiate them because they're not whole. They don't have the structure to be able to process the things that they're trying to satiate themselves with. And then through the span of the song is the sort of the transformation when the person embraces the storm and recognizes that a forest only grows higher than the depths it knows, that like you have to go deep in order to, to go right. Why do you think it's important that others know your story? Um, That's an interesting question. I don't know that I think it is important that people know my story. Um, I think it's important that I feel that I created something that is as authentic as possible in the hopes that if someone were to experience the music, that they would see their own experience in the music. And so if someone were to listen to Jolene, they wouldn't think, wow, Sarah Hazarek performing Jolene is really great. They would think, yes, I had a Jolene in 2006. Her name was Rebecca and I felt the same way and now I can process. Um, I think that sometimes when people who are experiencing art know 
the intention behind it, it almost dampens their experience with it. And so I feel like I, I am available to express the experience if people are curious about it, but my hope more than anything is for people to be able to experience their own experiences through the music. Why music? I think my interpretation of why music is, is for other people. So why music to other people? Um, because as you said, music is a universal language. It's one of the few. Um, music expresses tangible emotions. Um, music moves us. Music changes us. Music teaches us. Music pushes us, um, even if you don't ask it to. That there can be a song that enters into your experience and you have to pull over on the freeway and are suddenly transformed into a different person than you were 10 seconds earlier. I don't know personally of another art form that has that power. Sarah Gazarek, our guest during In Studio from Simply Timeless. The name of her album is Thirsty Ghost. Be sure and check it out with her other works at the website sarahgazarek.com. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing some of your story with us this week. And thanks also to you, our listener, for taking the time to join us for In Studio. Until next time, I'm Jay Daniels. Have a great week.